Hey everyone, we're live. We're getting everything tweeted out right now. Um, I am your host, Scott Lewis, and well, we're going to be doing something a little bit different this time. Uh, we're going to be trying to export these and produce them as a podcast as well. So in probably like three minutes, I'm going to start the show and be all, you know, professional or something. Um, but if you want uh, to to ask us questions during the show, we'll try to answer them at the end of it. Um, or, since this is a multi-part series, we will try to also address them afterwards uh, in, in uh, the following episode. So feel free to tweet uh, at me, Scientific Scott, also Katie Mack at Astro Katie, uh, and leave us a question right there. For, it's focused on you. So, um, so also leave us uh, comments on YouTube. So in this video, you can leave them below. Also on Google Plus in the event page where the Q and A app is in. I have the Q and A app loaded. Lots of different ways for you to ask questions about dark matter. Like I said, we're gonna be doing um, a bunch of uh, of videos on this to try to dig a little bit deeper than you know rushing through. So this way, if there are a lot of questions on a single topic, we can dedicate an entire show to that and try to go there. Because, so. because Dark Matter is way too cool for just one show. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's totally simple. I mean, we're just, we're just milking it for what it's worth. Yeah, Dark Matter is so easy to understand. <laughs> all right. Well, I am going to get this show going, and let me close all the other one of my tabs so I can actually focus on hosting the show because I see all the tweets. Hi, Twitter. All right, uh, let's let's do this. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Scott Lewis, your host from Space Fan News, and welcome to another conversation with an astrophysicist. With me, as always, the wonderful Katie Mack. How are you doing today, Katie? Hello. I'm all right. How are you? I, I'm a little tired. It's late, but it's in the afternoon. But we're in the same day right now. So that's, true. that's awesome. Are, are we? Is it not? Is it not after? Oh yeah, it's after midnight. Yeah. It's, so it's after are, midnight. So, so we're welcome to Saturday. Night. Yes. Happy Saturday, yeah. everybody. How's the future? Has anything died yet? It's great. The yeah. future is awesome. We've yeah. we've all got jetpacks. So we're just waiting for you to get there. Awesome. Send them to me. <laughs> Well, what we're going to be doing for not only this episode, but in the next following episodes, we are going to be digging into dark matter. Uh, we let everyone know as we're recording this live as well and broadcasting it live that uh, people can interact with us. Um, I am Scientific Scott on Twitter, and Katie is at Astro Katie. And we will try to dig in a little bit deeper, but this first episode we're going to be doing just a, a general overview about what dark matter is, how it was discovered, and get uh, just get a good primer for when we dig deeper in the following episodes. So, Katie, yeah. what is dark matter? Okay. Um, so dark matter is it's a kind of matter, and when we say matter, we mean something that has mass. That's basically... All you need to know about matter, it has mass. Um, so it interacts with gravity, and it has a gravitational force, uh, or gravitational attraction, so things are attracted to it. It's attracted to other things through gravity. Um, so it's kind of matter, uh, but it's invisible. So um, I think that... So s some have suggested that dark matter is not a great name for it because it's not dark in the sense of, like, you know, a black thing is dark. It's dark in the sense of you can't see it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why you can't see it but it is invisible, um, and it is matter, and it just so happens that it's most of the matter in the universe. It's about 85% of the matter in the universe. Isn't that just our It's completely invisible. <laughs> most of the matter in the yeah. universe, we can't even see it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and that's not even talking about dark energy, which is most of the energy density in the universe, and that like totally dwarfs the amount of stuff that dark matter is even. But um, just sticking to matter for the moment, we can talk about dark, ma dark energy in some other episode. Um, oh, I'm sure we will. I, yeah, so I it's, will. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it's, yeah, so it's most of the, it's most of the matter in the universe, and if you, if you were able to, like, look at, if you're able to see all the matter in, like, a galaxy, and you can't, because most of it's dark, but if you're able to see that dark matter, it would be most of the stuff 
of a galaxy, and like like you have you have this huge like galactic halo. It's called like a sort of like ball of matter, and then inside is a little tiny galaxy, just in in sort of the center part. Right. Um, so it's yeah. So it's like it's it's most of the stuff of of a galaxy, um, and it's most of the stuff that makes up like the cosmic web. So the um, the like. Uh, like know, my favorite, the, my favorite images uh, of that. It's just so yeah. mind-boggling, amazing seeing the the cosmic web, the filamental structure of the yeah. grand scale. Oh, love it. Yeah. So like the the universe is is made of like clusters and filaments of matter, and it makes this sort of web-like structure where there's voids and there's like sort of web things connecting everything, and most of that is made of dark matter. Um, also, so how so, do we know that it's made of dark matter? I mean, we we can see the halo, yeah. we can see the galactic bulge, but so okay, we can yeah. see that, and we just went over that we can't see dark matter. So how do we know that that yeah. there? So we know that dark matter is yeah. So we know the dark matter is there because we know we can see how it makes other things move around. We can see how it affects the motion of uh, other things that have mass um, that we can see, like stars and galaxies and gas and things like that. And we also see that it affects the way that light moves because um, of gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing is where um, where matter of some kind warps the, the shape of space-time and makes light move in a different way. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more slightly later on. Um, but, yeah, you know, I've got some pretty images. Grab- and if yeah, you're listening yeah, to this yeah. on the podcast, I will put it into the show notes as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so we know about it through, through basically the way that it makes um, things that we can see move. Um, so it's like... It's like... Uh, like, you know those, like sort of light paintings where people move flashlights around and then take a long exposure picture and you see like you know some kind of shape that they've made by like spinning a flashlight around or spinning some kind of light around um, you can't see whatever's doing the spinning but you know that something did it because all that light was moving around in a way that you just would not expect otherwise right and right. so it's it's similar with it's similar with dark matter where we look at the way that stars and gas and galaxies move and the way they're moving just does not make sense with the stuff that we see that's already there. So, um, one of the so so there there are two people who were like really important in the discovery of dark matter as like a part of the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one in, in chronology um, was this guy called Fritz Zwicky, um, who was around in the 30s, and awesome he name. was looking at how yeah, it's a good name. He was quite a character as well. You should look him up, uh, yeah. Fritz Zwicky. Um, so he looked at the way that galaxies moved in a cluster of galaxies. So there's this cluster of galaxies called the Coma Cluster. It's got lots of galaxies in it, and those galaxies move around, like they sort of orbit the center of the Coma Cluster, like bees, you know, sort of moving around. Um, and he looked at the way that they moved around, and they all move around because they're sort of orbiting the center of mass of this cluster, right? So they're all kind of orbiting around sort of each other. They're in this sort of gravitational, um, Bond, um, and he looked at how they moved, and they were moving too fast. And it, they, he counted up all of the clusters, all of the galaxies in the cluster, added up how much mass that would be, and like it was just everything was moving too quickly. And the only way to explain that was that there's some kind of gravity, uh, some kind of extra stuff with gravity, sometimes extra, some kind of extra gravity holding all these little clusters, all these little galaxies into the cluster, and otherwise right. they would have flown away, and because they were just going too fast. Um, and so he proposed that in the 1930s, and everybody was like, nah, that's a silly idea. Um, and silly so Zwicky in your science. Yeah, so, I mean, so it wasn't, I mean, not everybody said that, but it, it wasn't, like, accepted at all for a long time. Um, it was kind of assumed that, you know, measurements were wrong or, you know, that he just, he had the wrong idea about something. Um, um, and then in the 1970s, another astronomer called Vera Rubin came along, and she did a detailed study of how stars move around in disk galaxies, so spiral galaxies. So our galaxy is probably is a spiral galaxy, so it's right. kind of in a flat disk, and there's stars and stuff in the disk, and the stars move around the center um, over the course of like millions of years, 
um, and they they go around and um, you can you can measure in other galaxies and and to some extent in our own how quickly all these stars are moving around and if you had so if you if you look at a spiral galaxy and you add up all of the all of the matter that you can see in that spiral galaxy you see like a bulge in the center and you see a bunch of stars and you see some gas um, you can count up how much how much matter that is and how much gravity it should it should you know give you and then you can calculate based on that how quickly the stars should be moving around because the in it, based on sort of any kind of gravitational theory the the speed at which things move around when they're gravitationally bound and orbiting something is just based on how much matter is in the center and to some very small extent how how massive the thing moving around is right. um, and how and far away so, it is, right yeah, how, yeah, how far away it is and how quickly it's moving. So, like in our solar system, um, most of the matter is is in the center in the sun, mm -hmm. and so as you as you move out in the solar system, uh, the things moving, the things orbiting very close, like Mercury and Venus, are moving very quickly. And as you go farther out, um, for more distant uh, objects like Jupiter and Neptune, um, are moving much more slowly, and they take a really long time to go around because they're very far out and they're moving a lot more slowly. And so this is um, so you can like you can make a graph of that, and basically um, the speed of the things that are close in are moving very fast. Or, or is the, the speed of those things is very high, and the speed of things far away is very low. And so there's this kind of curve that you get, um, and that's called the rotation curve. And so Vera Rubin worked that out for a bunch of different galaxies, and for galaxies it should be about the same as for solar systems, in that most of the gravity, most of the massive stuff is in the center. And right, because we, we're seeing that bulge and that halo and yeah, the supermassive yeah, black the hole. Bulge. We're we're expecting it all in the center, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean the halo. So when we talk about the halo of galaxy, we're usually talking about like the stuff that's orbiting a little bit farther away, and then we're talking about the dark matter halo. But but the bulge in the center is like gotcha. the thing where it's most of the mass, and then there's the disk, and the disk doesn't have very much mass at all. It's pretty thin, um, and so stars that are very far away toward the outside of the disk should really be orbiting as though almost all the mass is in the center. Um, and you can figure out how much mass that is. And so as you go out farther out in the galaxy, it should just drop off. Um, just like in uh, the solar system, you should have things farther out moving much more slowly. So um, yeah, so this picture that you've just put up yeah. um, is a rotation curve. Um, and there's, and what Vera Rubin found was that instead of the velocity, the rotational speed going down as you go far out, um, toward the edge of the galaxy, uh, that's the calculated curve, the red curve there. Right. Um, what she saw is that the, the rotation speed really didn't go down. So it kind of just kept going out straight. It kept, it, the, she got all these flat rotation curves. Um, and that's really strange uh, because those, so based on how much matter you can, cal how, how much matter you can um, see in the gal mm -hmm. galaxy, those stars toward the edge that are moving really fast ought to just fly off the fly off the galaxy. Uh, right, that's like saying that Neptune has the same orbital period as Mars. I mean, that's kind of no. Silly, it's not right? the same. It's not the same orbital period, but it's the same orbital speed. speed. So Neptune gotcha. would still take longer to get around, but it would be going just as fast, which which it can't do, right? Like if right. It, it it would fly off into space. So it's like it's like if you have you know one of those those kids swing things where they have at carnivals where you're on swings and you it goes around and everybody kind of flies off toward the edges. Right, right. But, you right. know you don't actually fly off the swings. It would be like like those things would fly. Everybody would fly off. <laughs> like, <laughs> Wee! People would be scattered everywhere. See you later, right. solar system. Right. I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. So so do you have a, do you have the picture of uh, Vera Rubin's data? Um, I do. The spiral galaxies, because that's a really cool picture. Up. It is a really cool okay. picture. Uh, yeah. So, so she looked at a whole bunch of little of spiral galaxies, and she actually wasn't looking at the the way the stars moved. She was looking at the gas um, toward the edges of the galaxies moving. But that's even cooler because you can see when you do that that the gas toward the edge of the galaxy um, is still moving just as fast, even when you can't see any more stars. So, like even beyond where the stars end, like you still have. Uh, you still have everything moving really fast. So, like, something is holding even the stuff at the very, very edges uh, into, this, into this galaxy moving so fast. So, yeah, so this picture shows you the distance from the nucleus, which is the distance from the center of the galaxy, in kiloparsecs, which is thousands of parsecs, and parsecs are, like, 
three light years or something. Yeah, um, a little over three light years. And then, yeah, a little more than three light years. And then the rotational velocity, so how quickly everything's moving in kilometers per second. And what you see is for all of these galaxies uh, that she looked at, um, all of these rotation curves basically flatten out. Um, as far as you can see, um, whatever she's, you're measuring, in this case she's measuring the gas, as far as you can see the gas, uh, it's moving at about the same speed, um, you know, 25,000 kiloparsecs away as it is 5,000 kiloparsecs away from the center. So, or 5,000 parsecs away. So, like, you just have, you just have this huge range where everything's going just as fast. And so, the only way that can happen is if there's more matter holding everything in than what you can see. And so what was what was uh, discovered so, was that that means... Well, well, hold on just a second. So, yeah. so we're saying there, you know, the reason why we know things are going on in, in our solar system is that the center of mass is mm -hmm. our sun. That's where the main amount of mass is. And then yeah. we have a center of mass between our objects. And it happens just to be also inside the sun. So we're yeah. orbiting that. Now yeah. they're saying that this center of mass is actually distributed more. That we're actually, it's more like a merry-go-round type thing, where the center it's, of the merry-go-round is also more towards the outside. Or it's how? it's more that so it's not it's not that exactly. It's it's more that like the stuff that's so if all of the if all of the matter is concentrated at the center, like within the orbit of a thing. So like in in our solar system, almost all the matter is concentrated within the orbit of Mercury. So right. if you if you were to calculate the orbital speed of something of something orbiting at the distance of Mercury of the same thing, the same sort of concentration of matter, and you were to calculate the speed of something orbiting at the distance of Jupiter, and all the matter is still just where Mercury just within the orbit of Mercury, then you'd get this nice rotation curve where everything falls off. Um, in the galaxy, it turns out in spiral galaxies or in any galaxies, you can't make that approximation because there is more matter like because the the amount of dark matter um, it, it goes down somewhat as you go farther out, but it's not it doesn't like it's not all concentrated at the center. It's not all in a single point. So there's still a lot of dark matter um, within like you know as you go farther out. So so you can't make that approximation that everything's at the center because you're you're actually embedded in this dark matter like sphere kind of you know. Right. So like right. you have this huge concentration of dark matter that just keeps going as you go out. And so um, there is more matter holding um, a more distant star in than there is holding a, a near a close-in star. So the close-in star only cares about the stuff within, you know, within its radius, and there's less of it um, than there is for the thing that's farther away. So even though that thing is farther away, it's seeing mu a much stronger pull because it's, or it's seeing a, a sort of the same kind of pull because there's more matter. Right, right. And so... So the gravitational pole kind of doesn't really change, which means the velocity doesn't really change. So, you see which what I mean. you know, so you know, think about it. You know, at that time, you know, Zwicky seeing these, and and now we're seeing this as well. I'm like that's gotta blow their mind. There is something that's making it. I mean, just even thinking about that right there is like, yeah, you're having something pull in the same amount as something that's very close. You know, close to the center. Yeah. What? That that would cause all these questions, which it did. I mean, that's that's yeah, our yeah. big source of okay. There's something else going on here. Yeah. So and, yeah. So which yeah, kind of gives it its, its name, which a lot of people don't like its name, because um, yeah. we can't see I mean, it. Well, yeah. So I mean, you, I mean, they called it dark matter because it was dark in the sense they couldn't see it, but it's it's not. We know now, I mean, and we pretty much knew then, that it's not dark in the sense of, like, like when something is dark, like, when something is black, like, like this thing is black, it's black right. because it's absorbing light, not, not reflecting it. Um, dark matter doesn't absorb light. So this, it just so this doesn't brings interact us to, like, with the um, spectrum at all. Yeah, yeah, so this brings us to, like, some of the major properties of dark matter. Um, when, in, for most matter, um, for everything that we can see and touch, um, if you, like, if you, if you put your hand on the table, um, your hand does not go through the table, and the reason it doesn't go through the table is because there's electromagnetic repulsion between the, the table and your fingers, right. and that's right. that's what keeps us from passing through things is that electromagnetic repulsion um, from the. Which is good because I'm on the third floor, yeah, in my yeah, LA apartment. I, I would really like to stay that, here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with dark matter, dark matter doesn't feel electromagnetic 
anything, right? So it doesn't it doesn't feel that repulsion, and it doesn't interact with light. So light, you know, when we see something, it's because light is bouncing off of it and and hitting us. Mm -hmm. And so we see that reflection. We see things through the reflection of light or the production of light. Dark matter doesn't produce light and doesn't reflect light, so we cannot see it. So light passes right through it, and everything else passes right through it, right? So like. Although it has gravitational attraction, it doesn't have any kind of collisional stuff that we know about. So, or at least in any way that we've been able to measure, it doesn't produce light, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't collide with things, it doesn't collide with itself. So dark matter just passes through everything, everything passes through dark matter, but it still has gravity. So, uh, and this brings me to, I guess, our next point on, okay, so it's not emitting, absorbing, it's not interacting with light at all. Yeah. Um, but it still changes what we see when things, yes. when we're observing objects behind things that have lots of dark matter. Yeah. Um, what's yeah. going on with that? Because so, it, you're, you're saying here, oh, it doesn't interact, but I'm seeing it doing something yeah. to this light. What, what's happening? Yeah, so what it's actually doing is it's, it's messing with space-time. What? So everything, everything that has gravity messes with space-time. So, so there's this... Um, there's this connection between space-time and gravity and, like, mass, right? So what Einstein figured out, which was, like, his big um, insight in general relativity, was that, um, so the, the, way they, the way they phrase it is ma mass, uh, mass teaches space how to bend and space teaches mass how to move or some, something like that, tells mass. So, so whenever something has mass, it puts, like, a dent in space-time. Um, and you can't really, it's not, I mean, this is, this is an analogy. So, like, there's this analogy where you have, like, a trampoline, and you put a bowling ball in the center of the trampoline, and it makes a dent. And right. this is, like, an analogy for how mass bends space-time, space-time being, like, the fabric of the universe, basically. Right. Um, and I think the only problem with that analogy is that we're talking about a plane, so that's two dimensions, but now yeah, we're worrying yeah. about three-dimension like dimension denting, yeah. which is hard yeah, for so us to visualize. It's hard, yeah. But basically, if you're trying to... If you have a massive object, um, then the space-time around it is warped, so that if, like, you, if like, a, an object or a light is trying to pass by that massive object, it'll be deflected. So you have a picture of gravitational lensing? I this is do called have lensing. a picture of gravitational lensing. It's funny you should ask. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. Let me okay. my screen up. There we go. Okay. So... So yeah, so you have if you have a galaxy in the distance, and in this picture it's called the it's labeled blue galaxy. So Hello, blue a galaxy, galaxy. In the distance, and then you have a cluster of galaxies in the center, um, and then your your you know us in the Milky Way is over to the side. Um, so the so the the light comes from that distant galaxy, and it is bent around that dark matter because the dark matter kind of pulls the space time in, so it kind of like warps the space time around it, so the space time kind of gets like warped by it and, and squeezed by it, and so then um, stuff that's trying to go around it gets deflected, um, and so the light gets deflected around the dark matter, around all the matter, mm -hmm. um, and so so we see we see multiple images of things because you know like that blue galaxy is putting out light in all directions, right. but um, some of the light Which is that was meant those to miss three arrows in this ray diagram, so. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know for some, you know, I've heard a lot, even with some of uh, my students, that they, you know, they're confused. Why are there these three lines, and what does it show? Yeah. So when we're showing this ray diagram, this is really when we're doing optics and how it goes yeah. through a lens. So we're seeing a, a straight point through the cluster of galaxies, and then what would be on the outer edge of any sort of lens and if it moves yeah. and stuff like that. But it's actually yeah. emitting light in every single direction. We're just using this for yeah. the diagram. Yeah, so light is going in all directions, but some of the light that should have missed us comes around and bends toward us again. So we see the same galaxy, the same blue galaxy in the background in a few different directions. Because depending on how, you, how exactly you line up, you get different numbers of images, but you might see like three different images of the same galaxy or four different images of the same galaxy Right. Because um, some of them like go in different places, and so um, and so there are some some famous examples of this. If you look up Einstein's cross, that's an example of this, where you have something in the background, and then you have a galaxy, and the galaxy is lensing that thing, and so you have different images of the same thing, 
um, because some of the light's been bent around um, the, the galaxy or the cluster of galaxies. And Here's so a, the, one of uh, my, my favorite examples of, of showing how it worked and how it's warping what's coming yeah, through here. Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great image because it shows the, that warping of, of, of space-time. Um, in a, you know, it's a, it's weird because that's again a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional thing. Um, right. But anyway, so it's warping space-time. So, um, so that the amount of warping, the the dent, this like depth of that dent is entirely dependent on how much mass you have. So, if you have a galaxy or a galaxy cluster, and you know, and you can count up the amount of mass in the stars, in the gas, whatever, um, and then you measure the amount of lensing, there's more lensing than there should be. So you're just weighing that cluster of galaxies or the galaxy or whatever is doing the lensing. And what we do, what we find when we do that is we find that there's just way more lensing, that that dent is a lot deeper than it should be if it was just luminous matter, if it's just regular matter. And so some of that matter, most of that matter has to be dark. And so the amount of gravitational lensing you see is consistent with like almost all the dark matter, the, almost all the matter being completely invisible. So that's another way that we know that dark matter is there. So there are lots of different ways that we know dark matter is there. Um, there's that gravitational lensing, there's the rotation curves I mentioned, there's the dynamics of clusters, so the way that galaxies move around in clusters, which is what Fritz Zwicky saw. Um, there's things we see like signatures in the cosmic microwave background that could only be there if some of the matter is this sort of collisionless stuff, if it's this stuff that doesn't interact with with electromagnetism. Um, we see like the way that galaxies formed in the early universe, um, that formation would have been delayed if we didn't have something that was collisionless that could sort of clump together without having the sort of pressure that regular matter does, um, so which is we're saying a that complicated topic. That astronomers and astrophysicists, are, they're not just making it up, going, eh. Yeah. We don't know, so we're just going to give it a silly name yeah. and pretend. No, so yeah, so a lot of people seem to think that dark matter is like, oh, you didn't understand it, you filled in a gap with dark matter. How come it's not just that you didn't understand something, that gravity is different or something like that? And we'll talk about that more, I guess, in another yeah. episode. But, um, but the, I mean, it's basically, we just have so many lines of evidence now for dark matter in so many different sort of areas of astrophysics. Um, it would be really hard uh, to explain it away with some other kind of phenomenon. And there are, there are certain attempts uh, to have a different explanation, but most of those work just, just on a couple of these different like, issues, and they don't work for, the whole, for all, the different, all the big picture. So an analogy I like to use is like you're standing on a street corner, and you know, suddenly you feel a little bit cold, and you see a tree bending over, and you see uh, the street sign kind of wave, and you see some leaves move across a lawn, um, and you hear a wind chime in the distance, and all of those things happen at once. And you, you know, you could try to find explanations for each of those things, and maybe like, you know, maybe like a squirrel came up and hit the wind chime, and maybe like, you know, the the a cloud passed over the sun, and that's why you're cold, or maybe, um, you know, maybe the leaves, uh, I don't know, something. Something happened with the leaves that you don't understand. But Maybe like, Frosty the Snowman came by you and whispered. <laughs> and that's why you're chilling. Well, I mean, I don't know, but but the consistent explanation that that meets all of the that fits all of the evidence is that it's windy, you know, and there's right. a, a bit of wind, and you can't see the wind, but you have so many lines of evidence for the fact that the wind just came by that that's really the best explanation. Um, that's the simplest and it's explanation. Fitting it's the most all of those observations. It's not yeah, just yeah. one. It needs to fit all the all those phenomena that we're observing. Well, this right. is something that explains all of these. Not, you know, I could say that it was an invisible unicorn doing something, but it's not <laughs> fitting, you know, the coldness. For yeah. We all know that invisible unicorns are really warm, but they might rustle up some leaves now and then. But we we <laughs> need to have something that fits all of those observations, right? Right. Anyway, right. And, yeah, this is serious in, business. No laughing. Right. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and dark matter, dark matter is an example of a, a situation where you know um, it's just it's the simplest explanation. Even though you you have to you have to hypothesize a new phenomenon, a new kind of uh, thing in the universe. It's called dark matter. It's some kind of new particle. You have to you have to come up with a new particle to explain it. But it's still a lot simpler than saying all of these different things are happening, and you know, and 
you know, an explanation that works with one of them doesn't work very well with the other one. You know, dark matter explains all of these things pretty well. And there are some, there are a couple of little places where, you know, we don't understand exactly how it works, or it's, or maybe it doesn't seem as consistent. But for the, um, you know, taken as a whole, all of these things together, dark matter is a really good explanation. So it, it really is a very sort of evidence-based thing. It's not just like we're making something up because we right. don't understand. Right. So, you know, we do have a couple other points that we want to hit, but we're running out of time, which is fine, because we have more episodes to go, and I did want to answer some questions that are going on. I'm seeing from Twitter and on YouTube here. Um, and it, it's a, a question here from Daniel. And he's asking, should we call dark matter faster than light matter instead? So I'm not really understanding the context of that. But I, I know, Daniel, and I don't know if you asked this before we got into it into the show, but it's not interacting with light at all, right? Yeah, and it doesn't... We don't have any reason to believe that it's fast. Like, we know it's some kind of particle, or we're pretty sure it's some kind of particle, but we think that it actually is fairly slow-moving, Um and it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to react with light, but that's not because it's like outrunning it or something. It's just because it doesn't seem to have electromagnetic forces, or like right. it doesn't have that interaction, as far as we know. So there you go, Daniel. Uh, there's another one here from, and I'm, I'm sorry, we already we already touched on it, um, but uh, Gabor Cosper, and I'm so I'm so. Uh, sorry if I slaughtered that. But, you know, if the existence of dark matter is only based on the behavior of visible matter, how do you know it's a kind of, quote, matter and not another law of physics or fundamental force we don't know about that causes these right. anomalies? So I think that right. goes into so, your metaphor you're talking about, right? Yeah, so we touched on that a bit. Yeah, so um, so it's basically, it's just when you take everything together, uh, a new kind of matter fits all the evidence really well. It's something that gravitates, something that sort of clusters in a way we think we understand, um, and you don't have to screw around with the theory of relativity, which seems to work pretty darn well, um, right. in order to explain dark matter, if dark matter is a, a separate thing. If you want to mess with gravity, um, there are ways to explain some of these phenomena by changing the laws of gravity. Um, but there are certain instances, there are certain examples, and I'll talk about one of them next time. Uh, one of them is called the bullet cluster, which you can look up if you're interested, um, yes. where we see phenomena that really can't be explained just by changing gravity. You really do need a, a, an extra component of stuff in the universe. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there, it may be true that gravity is not the way we understand it, and it's probably true that there's more to gravity than we know about. Um, it's probably true that Einstein's theory is not, you know, the final answer there, because we know we need to, we, need, we, we know we need to get gravity to work with quantum mechanics, and so far that doesn't work within Einstein's theory. Um, but in terms of like what we can see on large scales in the universe, Einstein's theory works fantastically well, um, and so any change to it is probably going to be uh, pretty minor. And if there is a change to Einstein's theory, that's not going to be enough to take away the evidence for dark matter because the evidence for dark matter um, is really strong in a lot of different areas and you can't do like just one little tweak, tweak to gravity and fix everything. Right. Okay. Well, I think it's a good place to end here. Um, so tune okay. in next time, everyone. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more into wimps versus machos, uh, how much is really in the universe and why it's not modified Newtonian dynamics. Why is it not Mond and the, the, our detection methods? So uh, yeah, those are some yeah, of the, the, the topics we're going to be hit next time. If you have any questions for us or if you have anything that you want known about dark matter, let us know. Um, you can leave a comment here on YouTube. Um, but if you're listening to this in the future on iTunes or wherever we're putting this, uh, tweet at us. So, Astro Katie, where are you found? So, I'm on Twitter. Uh, that's the easiest way to find me. I'm Astro Katie at Twitter. Um, I am also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Astro Katie. Um, I don't update as much on there, but I, have, I do put some sort of more detailed explanations of things on there sometimes. Um, I'm also uh, on Google Plus at plus Katie Mac. And uh, you can find me on my webpage, which is uh, astrocady.com. Wow, all the Astrocady. 
And you can find me at Scientific Scott. I am Scott Lewis on Google Plus, uh, and we're we're over here on Space Fan News. I'm also uh, I have my website at knowthecosmos.com, which is currently being renovated, so it's kind of dusty right now. But we'll get that working uh, a little bit while later. Thank you uh, all for watching, for listening. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. I don't know. Are we going to be here next week or two weeks? I don't know uh, your schedule. I think I think we were thinking about two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. All right. So two weeks from now, same time, uh, we will see you all over here. And, yes, uh, I'm awkwardly ending this show for some reason. <laughs> so thank you all. all right. I did see the, the tweets out there, and uh, sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, thank you, though, for all those, everybody. You guys are great. So we will see you all next time. Okay, see you. Bye.